name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin to God who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, have mercy on us. We confess to you that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not trusted you with our whole heart. We have not loved one another in deed and in truth. In your compassion, forgive our sin, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our light and our truth, with joy, I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sin and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome to God's house. Would you please indicate your presence here today by using the QR code? on the back of the bulletin or in the pew rack in front of you is a card that says we're glad you're here. Please fill that out and put it on one of the, in one of the offering baskets on either end of the pew before you leave today. Thank you to the team that had the delicious, delicious breakfast this morning all summer long. We hope that you're taking advantage uh, of that. Thank you to the team that put that on today. Steve Burke, our Director of Social Media and Ministry, is going to be leading his workshop, Everyday Boldness. I hope every person in the congregation takes that at least uh, once. That's going to be this coming Saturday from 9 until noon here at the church. I commend that opportunity to you. Men, there's a mission trip for you to San Antonio on August 17th to the 19th. It's uh, in partnership with a sister congregation of ours in Lutheran Congregation in Missions for Christ. There's going to be a barbecue outreach. There's going to be some light construction. So men, we hope that you'll consider that opportunity. You can sign up for these opportunities and other ones on the iPad in the extended narthex or on our website, lwlc.com. We're also, it's also a joy today to welcome a new member into the congregation, Barbara Leffingwell. Barbara, would you stand, please? Barbara, we're delighted that the Holy Spirit has brought you here, and we welcome you into this congregation. Let us continue now with the anthem for the morning.
lesson is from Hebrews chapter 9 verses 24 through 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as a high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Read the psalm responsively. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding and I learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right. Let your steadfast love become my comfort. according to St. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Jesus said, Do not judge, so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, Let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. 
the Gospel of the Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. We praise you, gracious God, that as you gather us today in this your house, you gather us together as your people. You have claimed us in the waters of baptism. You have called us your own. And we live in the days you have appointed for us this side of heaven 
in the blessed assurance of your presence and your grasp upon us in the blessed assurance of heaven divine. In Jesus' strong and holy name we pray. Amen. Would you open your Bibles, please, with me to the sixth, seventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, the seventh chapter. You'll find that if you're using a pew edition this morning on page six. Matthew, the seventh chapter for our study today. It was off to the ballpark we went. Always a good day. A recent Ranger game, and it was one of those hot days. I was looking forward to the air conditioning inside. I remember the days of the old Ranger Field. You remember that, the converted minor league park. Then, of course, the ballpark in Arlington. But now the new park, air conditioning. Just before the game, the announcer said, it is 103 degrees, actual temperature outside. It is 74 degrees inside, to which the loudest cheer of the day <laughs> occurred from the fans. The trek from the parking lot was a, was a toasty one. And as we started to get near to the park, by all the restaurants, there was quite a commotion at the intersection. And there, as the crowds were coming from different directions to cross the street, there at the intersection were some street preachers. The lady had a long white dress on with a big cross. She was holding a rather large cross. There were several men, one with a bullhorn. He was passionately preaching. Another was handing out tracts. At that corner, it was rather frenetic. It was loud. The preacher desperately trying to be heard over the din of the noise that was occurring. As I listened in, as I looked at the signs, which were, were rather direct and, and blunt, I wondered to myself about the effectiveness or the merits of such an approach. That is something that can certainly be debated, right? The topic was the last judgment, the last judgment. The signs communicated it, the preacher communicated it, the last judgment. Judgment isn't that popular of a topic, especially these days, is it? Whether it be the last judgment or whether it be judging in and of itself, it's just not that popular, is it? Have you ever said to someone or have you ever heard someone say to you, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Because there seems to be a frown upon any kind of judgment that is made. The phrase goes, you do you, and I'll do me, and let's just not judge one another. Because the world would be a lot better place if we just didn't judge one another. The, the vision is lifted up of a world in which judgment is something that you would read about in the history books, personified by a bumper sticker. Have you seen it? That says, non-judgment day is coming. Non-judgment day is coming. We well, look at that bumper sticker and it seems like there are it seems like there are some big name advocates with regard to that. 
Well, listen to what Jesus says. Look at it with me, please. Verse 1 of chapter 7 of Matthew. Jesus says, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Jesus' brother, James, records in the fourth chapter, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So then, who are you to judge your neighbor? You've got Jesus. You've got James. How about Paul? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. So, would Jesus and would James and would Paul, would they say, that sticker, non-judgment day is coming, put it on my cart. Is that what they would say? And yet, yet you've got Corinth. Corinth was an absolute mess, an absolute mess in the church. And the Apostle Paul, Pastor Paul, was trying to straighten it out. And one of the problems he faced, he writes about in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not even found among pagans. For a man is living with his father's wife. And you're arrogant. Should you not rather have mourned so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you? Paul's concerned here because there's blatant sin that is apparent to the community and the community is doing absolutely nothing about it. They're looking the other way. Then he says this, For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, catch this, I have already pronounced judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus, on the man who has done such a thing. This was the same one who in 1 Corinthians 4 says, don't judge. And yet here he is saying, I've already pronounced judgment. Okay. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, please. In the very same chapter where the Lord Jesus Christ says, do not judge, verse 15, he says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Well, that's a judgment, isn't it? You, you can't call someone a false prophet prophet you can't say here that they're in sheep's clothing you can't call them that without making a what without making a judgment and this is just a few verses later here where Jesus said remember judge not and then 14 verses later what is he doing beware of false prophets He's judging. Is this some type of theological whiplash that is going on here? Because which one is it then? Are we not to judge or are we to judge? Then which one is it? Let 
The man was paralyzed. Four were attending him. He was absolutely dependent upon them. They were carrying their friends to Jesus. In Mark, the second chapter, it tells the story that when they come to the house where Jesus is at, the house is so full of people, they can't get their friend to Jesus. So what do they do? They go up onto the roof and they take advantage of how the roofs were built in ancient day. And they tear off the roof and they dig through it and they lower their friend in front of Jesus And Jesus looks at the paralytic and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Then listen to the rest of the story. In Mark, the second chapter, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? What are they doing? They're talking to themselves. They're questioning in their heart. It's not a verbal here. It's in the heart. Scripture says they were questioning in their hearts. At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is omniscient. Jesus knows all. He knew what was going on in their hearts. He knew exactly what they were thinking. He knew exactly what they were saying to themselves. He knew what was going on in their hearts. We don't. We don't. We don't know what's in the heart of the other. We don't know what they're thinking. Jesus does. We don't. We are not to judge the heart. Only God knows the heart. We don't. Back to that 1 Corinthians 4 passage when Paul says, don't pronounce judgment before the time. And then remember what he said of Jesus? He said that Jesus will disclose the purposes of the heart. We are not to judge the heart. Only God knows the heart. Okay, back to verse 1 of chapter 7 of Matthew. Jesus says, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. What's he talking about? He's talking about the heart. The heart. There are things that we are to judge and act upon. We are to judge them in accordance with the word of God. We are to act upon them in accordance with the word of God. That which is outward and that which is evident. Why, that's evident even in the text here. Because look at what Jesus says as he goes on in verse 3. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? 
you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Notice there's still the call to action there. That after we take the log out of our own eye, what are we to do with the neighbor? But we are to take the speck out of their own eye. That can only occur when a judgment is made. That can only occur because the speck is apparent. Look at verse 15 again of chapter 7. When Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Then look at what he says in the very next verse. You will know them by their fruits. See, that's not judging of the heart, is it? That's judging what is evident, what is apparent. The scripture reveals to us then this important distinction that there are things that we are to judge in accordance with the word of God and act upon it. And there are those things that we are not to judge. We are to judge in accordance with the word of God on that which is outward and that which is evident, that which is apparent, that which is seen, that which is heard, and we are not to judge on what we can't see, which is the heart. We're not to judge on what we think the other person might be thinking and to say, I know what you're thinking. No, we don't know what, we're th what they're thinking, right? Because they're not our thoughts. Because it's not evident. That's why scripture seems to say both things. But they're not saying two contradictory things. They're saying two complementary things. That indeed we are called to be a people that judge and act upon that which is outward and not to judge and act upon that which is inward. All right then. Why does God give us this call? Why does he give us this call? And how are we to do it? How are we to do it? Paul writes in Galatians 6, he says this. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression... Let me just pause there. If anyone's detected in a transgression, what does that mean? It means it's outward, right? It's evident. One isn't judging the heart. It, it's detected. It's, it's in front of one. It's like the, the situation in Corinth where you have the sin that is evident to the community and Paul is chastising the community for looking the other way and not dealing with it. It, it is, is evident. Paul says, my friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness. You who have received the spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Okay, catechism days. Remember when Luther writes about the biblical doctrine of the office of the keys? What's the office of the keys? It's the call to declare to those that repent that their sins are forgiven. Here's the hard part. Declare to those that don't repent that their sins are not forgiven. For what purpose? So they might be restored. That they might come to repentance. And how is one to do that? But one is to do that with gentleness. With gentleness. With the purpose of restoration. 
You see, the most loving thing is not when one's sin is apparent and manifest. It is not simply to say, who am I to judge? And walk away. That's not the most loving thing. That's not how we care for one another. It's not the most loving thing to say, hey, we're all sinners. Who am I to judge? No, the most loving thing is in gentleness to speak to the one with regard to the sin that is apparent and being unrepented of and to do it with the understanding that we too are sinners. To do it with gentleness. We fall short with regard to this all the time. All the time. We don't judge what we should judge. We don't act on what we should act on. And, what, and we judge what we should never judge. We fall short all the time on not acting with regard to the outward and finding it really easy to judge what we shouldn't judge, the inward. It is a frightening prospect, is it not? It is a frightening prospect to come before the Lord on the day of judgment cloaked only in our sinfulness. That is a frightening prospect. And the day of judgment will come. Scripture tells us, 2 Corinthians 5, for all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 4, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Each of us will be accountable to God. 2 Timothy 4 says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, judgment day will come. And here's the good news. It's the glorious gospel. Hebrews, the ninth chapter. He has appeared, speaking of Jesus, once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he took all of our sin upon him. It's the great sacrifice. Jesus bore all of our sin, the guilt of our sin. Scripture then goes on and says, and just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Judgment day is coming and beloved, we can stand confident on that day, knowing that we have been judged not guilty through Christ. Not guilty. Because Jesus has borne the punishment in our place. In the meantime, by God's grace, may we be found faithful. May we be found faithful in judging and acting upon what he calls us to judge and act upon. 
that which is evident and outward and judging and acting upon it based on the word of God. Judging and acting upon it with gentleness, with the motive to restore. By God's grace, in the meantime, may we not judge what we are not called to judge. May we not judge the heart. In the meantime, by God's grace, may we live the distinction. Let us rise. Confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please remain standing. Let us pray for the people of God in Christ Jesus 
and for all people according to their needs. Righteous Jesus, we thank you for entering the heavenly sanctuary to present us blameless before the Father. We ask that we would go forth daily with this promise of life upon our lips so that all would hear of your glory, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Sovereign Lord, empower us to judge and act upon what we should judge and act upon. Empower us to not judge the heart. Forgive us when we fall short in this call. Thank you for judging us not guilty through Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy God, guide us to live according to your word. Give us hearts of compassion for the lost and hurting. Use us to bring comfort, healing, love, and joy to the ends of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful Father, give rest and healing to everyone weighed down by sin, sorrow, or suffering, especially George Nichols, Gail Schaust, Song Chung, Donna Bigelow, Tim Lord, Francis King and family, Ken Brooke. Father, comfort all who grieve, especially Audrey Wall and family, as they mourn the death of her husband, Dewey. Hear now the prayers upon our lips and in our hearts. Into your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your goodness and mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus <coughs> took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, our Lord took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you of his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.